I want people to understand that there's hope and there's help. All they have to do is ask. MLive asked for first-person essays from Michigan residents impacted by mental health issues. Their stories offer windows into the lives of people struggling with and learning to manage their mental health and the mental health of their loved ones. I always knew I had issues, but at the same time, I simply attributed it to just the way I am. It wasn't until I became two a great years actress, pretending like year. everything was okay at home and at work. I wanted to be this strong woman who could handle her career, motherhood, home responsibilities, relationships, money, and grief without skipping a beat. I went I to a therapist how I was one day a week from for everyone, an hour. My family, my friends, and my boss. I had trouble getting through each day without struggling to take my life. Julie Gregory lost her daughter to suicide. Her daughter, Jessica, was diagnosed with anxiety, bipolar disorder, and depression. After being bullied at work, Jessica suffered a nervous breakdown. Things seemed kind of normal, except for that she didn't have a job, and she was getting short-term disability, and so she, her rent was being paid. Julie says for the next year, Jessica's days were filled with searching for work and hiding behind the mask she wore to hide her pain. We sat right here in the living room and started doing this 1,000-piece puzzle. Jessica's last family dinner was on March 9th, 2015. It was, you know, 10.30 at night. We're still working on this puzzle, and I, I got tired. I had to go to work in the morning, and she went home. Yeah, she was quiet. Should I have given her that extra hug before she left? You know, told her how much I loved her, told her, you know, all those things, the, the coulda, shoulda, wouldas that go on in your life. You know, I, yeah, it's something I live with. But I don't think that the extra hug would have helped her that night. Um, she went out that day and bought a gun. She bought a gun and her intentions were to end her pain that mm -hmm. night. I spent hours with her in her room, hugging her, holding her trying my best to convince her of the love I and others have for her and her worth and value, and to live Bipolar for her isn't child. easy to see. It's the little things. Random days where my dad was super angry. Nights where my dad was in this really funny laughing mood. Weeks of him being sad and upset. Nothing you might notice very How does one person quickly, become accustomed to their significant other laying on a couch for days, trying to fix someone who doesn't come with the right tools to be fixed? Tony Moyer moved to the U.S. from Iran with his father during the Iran-Iraq War when he was 11. Due to immigration laws, his mother was forced to stay behind. He never saw her again. Two years later, Tony's father died and Tony ended up homeless at the age of 14. You know, this is a story where I survived war. I survived cancer. I survived suicide. I survived not having a job, being homeless, no parents. I mean, I could have probably been six feet under right now if I made, made different decisions. Bad depression, I get up, I'm, I'm, I feel worthless, worthless. I feel like the day need to end right now. I sleep all day. Um, I don't eat. I, I turn all the blinds. Um, the bad thoughts comes in my head. Th think about my mom, my parents. I blame myself. After 30 years of suffering with depression, helping others and offering encouragement has been the driving force in his life to make sense of the pain he has endured. Now I noticed that by me helping people, the more people that I make happy and they have a good experience with me, the more happy I get. So that was kind of my medicine. Hannah Wolf suffers from anxiety manifested in the form of panic attacks, which she calls her personal demon. It was the strongest feeling I've ever felt that I was going to die because you, you can't control what's going on with your, with your heart and your brain. Hannah struggles to find a trigger for the attacks, which in some cases send her to the hospital. So what do the doctors say? What do you hear from doctors? It's a lot of health anxiety where I think, you know, something has to be wrong with my heart because otherwise why would I be feeling like this? Um, so I've been to cardiologists and I've had MRIs and they say it's just anxiety. 
everything is fine. Talk to me about how this impacts your life. Nighttime is very hard for me. Being alone, sometimes I'll have to stay at somebody's house or I'll have to have my dad come stay like I'm a child because I can't make it through the night by myself. Some days you don't want to get up and do anything. Not that you don't want to, it's that you are just scared because what if you get your heart rate up and then what if it just keeps going up and then what if you know you get trouble breathing and it can feel really scary. Just accept it and just survive it until the next one. Let's stop bashing people for having mental illness and instead educate ourselves on how we can help and show others the support they need. We all go through things and you aren't weak for asking for help. I have finally accepted that I will always take medication for my illness. It's not a character flaw, it's an illness. I spent many years just struggling Struggles to get with through the days. Health have no bearing on the individual's strength or character. In fact, it has been my experience that those who reach out for help in the midst of these struggles are some of the strongest people I know. Dale Robertson started seeing his doctor to treat his depression after encouragement from his wife, Sonia. He did focus in on what was really, I felt, the key issues for me and begin to work through that. And the talk therapy this has a big piece of that. And so that began to work uh, about four months, four weeks, six weeks or so in. He did offer, prescribe some drugs. I, t I did accept it. And it it made all, all the difference in the world. The other part that he also prescribed was exercise. And that, is, that has been key. So for me, I think it was the, it's the continued uh, talk therapy, the medication, but the exercise and those coming together have made all the difference in the world for me. He no longer tries to cover up or shy away from discussing his struggle with depression. He first publicly admitted it in open court while on jury duty. And it was a trial regarding uh, a victim who was mentally ill. One of the questions was, anybody on this jury know anybody with a mental illness? I've got to, I, I have to, with all this going through, I have to raise my hand and say, yeah, I know somebody. It's me, essentially all the world to hear. Here's who I am. Here's part of who I am. If you have loved ones who you know suffer from depression or mental illness, tell them you love them, that you need them here, that they make the world a better place. I wish I my story were unique, I stopped trying to be someone else and learned how to become myself. I learned who I am and finally started loving myself. I finally started letting myself be loved. I, I decided here. I needed to fight this. I needed to stand up for myself and save myself, that this wasn't how I wanted to live anymore, and that's exactly what I did. Abigail Bowley suffers from a depressive disorder that she says prohibits her from experiencing the world in the same way as others. But her mother says horse therapy has been Abigail's saving grace. You know, it's not just a horse. I, I don't know how to emphasize enough that it's not her just being around a horse. It's given her a lot of coping skills. She's not just brushing a horse for an hour, you know, she's sitting there talking with Miss Susan and discussing frustrations that she's having. Abigail, I think, feels like that this horse wants to see her. The horse doesn't tell her that she's, that she's wrong. The horse doesn't tell her, you know, get over it. The horse doesn't, even the horse doesn't give her all these answers, I guess, because sometimes that can be very overwhelming just to hear, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing this. So it is a very non-judgmental, Abby is just able to be Abby. Rebecca's advice to other parents of children with behavioral health issues is to start with love. Come from a place of love and try to not necessarily understand because I don't think it's really possible to fully uh, understand what your child's going through, but to love them exactly right where they're at.